Okay. All right, so we're back to Ecclesiastes uh, after our uh, really rich uh, class last week with uh, Morning Hope and Renewal. Uh, I'll be gone next Sunday morning, so Dale will be taking up Ecclesiastes chapter 10 next Sunday. And Julia will be preaching next Sunday. So it'll be a great Sunday. Um, we're, we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 uh, this morning, a, a text filled with all sorts of maddening and confusing statements. <laughs> so uh, we'll just kind of take it uh, section by section here. So uh, verses 1 through 3, one, one way we, we might think about this, maybe a, a heading that we might put there is that good and bad things happen to good and bad people. Good and bad things happen to good and bad people. So the author says, but all this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous, and so notice the, the, the pairs of words here, um, I put the, the, the synonyms in, in, in colors here. So uh, there's, a, there's a pairing of righteous, uh, good, clean, those who sacrifice, those who are good, those who swear, and then, and then their opposites in red. Examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. It is the same for all. Since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice, as the good one is, so is the sinner and he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that the same event happens to all. Also the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that they go to the dead. All right. So uh, the author is uh, playing off a little bit of, of uh, you know, what we might view as conventional wisdom that um, uh, we and they tended to operate on the basis of uh, good people get good things. Uh, in, in this text, he mentions love, love and hate, these two sort of broad categories of, of things that we might anticipate experiencing in life. And uh, often we, we tend to operate on the assumption that good people get good things. Good people experience love. Good people experience um, applause and approval. Good people are those that, that get that sense of community and belonging. And then uh, bad people get the bad stuff in life. So in, in this case, hate. Uh, if you're if you're bad, you get treated bad, and and that's part of the predictability of the world. But he turns that on its head and says, uh, well. Yes, and good people also experience bad things in life. Uh, love or hate, you don't know what you're going to get. So if, if you're good, you still might experience hate. And, and if you're bad and you do the wrong things, you still might experience love. You might be popular and, and applauded. And, and so he, he plays that out here. But what is certain, let me have one more slide, I guess I know. Uh, what, what is certain here is that all will die. So uh, we go back to this text here. Um, the way that he ends it here. Uh, also the hearts of the children of man are full of evil and madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. And so when he says in verse two, it is the same for all the same event happens. He's talking about two things here. One, one is this idea of love and hate. Uh, they're going to happen to both the righteous and the wicked, the good and the evil, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the other is that, that they're all going to go, they're all going to die. doesn't matter if you're good or bad, uh, you are going uh, to die. So we've, we've seen this thing before in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, he seems to be uh, quite taken by this idea that it doesn't matter who you are. You're going to die. Uh, so, so let's just talk a little bit about that. Um, how, how does the certainty of death 
impact you negatively or positively? I mean, um, how, how does it feel to, to think about the fact that, yes, I'm, I'm mortal, I'm going to die, I'm not going to be around forever. Uh, how, how does that impact you positively or negatively? Yep. I mean, that really is a, you know, where it shows good and bad, but you know that you have a finite life, you should be good. You know that you have a finite life, so you should be good. Okay. Yeah. So be good. Be, why? Sorry. Why be good? Well, I mean, there's a lot of value in good things. Like, you know, I, I know you need to flip the things around, but I think good brings good. And so, okay. Be good. And, and I, I'm not so much in the good terms into bad and, mm -hmm. you know, that, that juxtaposed position. So good is good. So if everybody's going to die, your life is temporary. Therefore, make, sort of like make the most of it. Be well, you know, remind yourself that, that it's finite. You remind yourself that uh, you should, uh, uh, when I say uh, good, I, I think you should make good translates into love. And so live a life of love and, and, and it'll be good. And okay. That should be your, uh, at least A, B, or things. Okay. Well, well I, I, I. Go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, I feel like it is fear, it's fear to life. You know that everybody, regardless of you know your standard, so everybody will die. It, I, to me, I feel like it is fair. That's how it impacts me. Because you see some people that you know they have nothing; they just live a horrible life, and some people live a well, good life, and you know, eventually everybody will die. It's it's the great leveler, right? It's yeah. what we all have in common. Yes. Yes. Um, I feel like our death is just the end of the chapter. There's something else hmm. after that. And, uh, and I want a good start in that next chapter. Hmm. Yeah, so, so we understand especially that life under the sun is, is not the only life. And, and the writer of Ecclesiastes only, only occasionally hints, hints at that. But we, we certainly understand that, uh, Scott. Uh, <clears throat> To me, the temporal nature of life makes it more beautiful. And by that, I mean, um, it's like the fall of season. I mean, it's so spectacular and it's so temporal. Mm -hmm. It is only there for a few weeks. And <laughs> it makes it beautiful. beautiful. Uh, but what I, I said, why that is because, I know, unfortunately, I think a lot of people <coughs> end up uh, end up having the most meaningful interactions with people when they know they're not going to be here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a tragic thing. And you, we all save ourselves when we're in those moments. I wish I had taken the mundane. Mm -hmm interactions we had years ago and had these meaningful conversations, but that's rarely when they happen. They happen when we're, when someone's about to go. Okay. Yeah. So things that are short, temporary, uh, sometimes have more meaning and value uh, to us. David and then Dean. I'm reminded of something my, uh, my brother was in the year ago, uh, you know, which was maybe one of the more spiritual people that I knew. And, Though if you don't know, you can pass away from cancer about a year and a half or a year about the belly. I remember talking with him about cancer and he said it was a blessing for him hmm. because he had the time to prepare emotionally, financially, etc. for his family. He said there are people <coughs> who get thumbs in the blink of an eye and, and everything is just unknown. Hmm. In his situation, he said he was blessed to know that he had the time, finite as it was, to make the necessary preparations. Um, and, he, and he lived his, 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 his kind of years, maybe a year and a half after, and I think uh, all medical options were exhausted, hmm. you know, with that mindset. Wow, yeah, that's a powerful testimony. Thank you. Me? Um, I was reading the story with what uh, we had 
genital cancer, and she was a patient. She had to be prepared for what she did in that clinic. And her person, that her person was uh, she would have worked in her own house at her home, then work in less of the China, in the fine China, in the furniture. Mm -hmm. She would let the kids run wide, longer, about the work, less about them mm -hmm. waiting something. And he said, he said, she said that knowing that life is a journey, she said, I would make, I would make several stop mm -hmm. along the line. And she started asking simple questions. When was the last time you asked yourself, why is this beautiful flower on the other side of the highway? Mm -hmm. Or pause to see um, uh, a deer feeding, breastfeeding his uh, cubs mm -hmm. on the side of the highway. I remember after I read it, I was like, I used to go to Canada. When I went to Canada, I used to like, fly to Canada. And one day I said, okay, I'll take up on the story. I happened to start at Lake Joy and realized that Lake Joy is a beautiful place right next to the highway. Mm -hmm. And it took me like 12 hours to get, 12 to 13 hours to get to Canada. I was the most um, rewarding trip. Mm -hmm. So knowing there is a man that the um, but that is, you start enjoying life more. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't have to be expensive. It can be like just mm -hmm. uh, be present when you are with the friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah. All sorts of really good uh, aspects to this. Uh, let me go back. I'm sorry. There. Um, so, and pressing on here, one of the things, one of the other things that he's, he's certain about in terms of life is that everybody good or bad is in God's hands, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Now, uh, Peter Enns in his commentary on this says that to, to be in God's hands in this case is not necessarily a statement of comfort. We, we kind of read that as a statement of comfort. God's God as he's holding us. Um, but it's, it's really more a statement about the fact that our lives are operating really according to the wishes and will and desire of someone else. We're in God's hands, not our own hands. So what, what God wants, what God desires for our lives is what's going to happen. Um, and, and our plans are not necessarily always going to come to fruition. Uh, in other words, not everything in my life is in my control. There's someone else, God, who is doing stuff in the world and I'm not always in charge of it. Um, what impact does that have on you to think about the fact, not only are you gonna die, but there's a lot of things in your life that may be completely outside of your control. Stephanie. So Luke and I have been married for 10 years, don't have any kids. We've been on a journey of infertility over the past eight years. Mm. Um, and it's something that's out of my control. Mm. And I'm a control freak. <laughs> um, so it's been very hard. But it's one of those things. It's not in my control. And it's been a God thing for sure. Um, and so it's been a lesson. So God has taught me through that, that not everything is in my control. But how can I use what's going on in my life to bring glory to him? Mm. And so whether that's through teaching children's Bible class so that adults with kids can have time away from their children mm -hmm. or starting a support group back in Oklahoma that thrived for a long time. Um, I was how can I bring glory to God through my school teachers? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. I appreciate your willingness to, to, um, to learn from that and, and to um, not allow it to be a, source of giving up or just washing your hands of God. Yeah. Thank I you. mean, that definitely happened. Though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, another thing that's certain, according to the author in these first three verses, is that everyone, good and bad, righteous and unrighteous, uh, will experience love and hate. So everyone's going to die, Peter Ann says, but, but what happens before that death is not always predictable. 
uh, you, before you die, you may be good and you may experience hate. Before you die, you may be bad and you may experience love. There's, in, in his mind, there's a little bit of the, the roll of the dice. It's, it's not a straightforward equation. Um, there's unpredictability about it. Love and hate happen to all. Regardless of what kind of person you are, you will be loved and you will be hated. Um, okay, so, so taking that reality, what reason would you have to be good? Yeah. And if being good is just going to get you hated, why, why, be, why be good? I think one thing you learn when you live the while is that life is just easier if you try to do it. Hmm. And it treats you better if you try to do it. And it's really being good is a shortcut to good outcomes, even though you know life pulls us all kinds of stuff. But overall, it's easier when you're good. Hmm. So if, if we were to take the, the full measure of love and hate and the experience of a life, in, in, your, in your mind, when we're good at the end of life, the, the good that we've experienced as a result of that is, is going to outweigh. Also, it. when you're good, other people appreciate that and they want to help you. Hmm. Uh, so that, you know, that raises the uh, outcomes. And life is a, it's the sum of all this stuff. It's not just this one little track. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, Kathy and then Kendra. Yeah. When, you, when you're putting out good, you're um, spreading it, making more of it in the world or whatever to follow mm -hmm. with it. So, you know, even, even if bad things are happening to you in response to the good you're putting out, overall or over time, because sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, it takes years for good to happen to change things or whatever, but still, the more good you put out there, the more there is in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah. I think that it's easier sometimes to deal with things that are bad or unjust if, if you know you've done the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, if you know that that you're doing the right thing, that you, mm -hmm. what you're pushing for, what you're supporting is is what you believe God wants, then, then you can easier. you can handle a little bit of the hate. The, yeah. yeah. Uh, sure. I, mean, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, you know, I think it's a good lesson to learn that, you know, not everybody's going to want to be reached. And mm. a lot of us, you know, because in some ways, yeah, I'm annoying <laughs> you know, to some people for some reasons. Um, and not, some people don't see that part prominently, which is good, which I appreciate. <laughs> but to know that, um, that it's to some extent, it helps you know, we have laws. <laughs> And that's one reason why that is good love because you have laws and somehow mm -hmm. those things rise up to their memory of mm -hmm. you. Yeah. But it's good to know because, you know, um, well, you know, when you just you have to accept it because it's just a fact. Everybody knows they have laws, but they don't realize or think that everybody's going to just not like them because of those. <laughs> but, but it helps you to, to know what we need to change. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Provide some humility. I think one of the things I've grasped with more than I've gotten away from is embracing indifference. Mm -hmm. And, you know, doing the right thing is what I'm going to do, and people are going, you know, you posit it as, you know, doing good wasn't going to be good if people hate you. And it sometimes doesn't have to be bad. It could be, well, it is what it is, not really different. So I've this point where. You know, I, I mean, it sounds bad to say I just don't care, um, but there are certain things in terms of our own emotional health to be able to compartmentalize mm -hmm. like what is worth my time and what is not worth my time. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Sometimes we, we do care too much. Mm -hmm. And and this, this um, posture of indifference can allow us to do what we think is the right thing to do and, and just let everything else forward today. Yeah. Uh, John and Scott. Just real quick, we, you know, we're approaching this sort of with the assumption that it's a tie. Good ties and evil or evil ties, but it's not a tie. Right? Good prevail over evil in a big way. So it's not a tie. So my suggestion is try to <laughs> <laughs> go with the winning side. Yeah. Scott. 
Uh, you know, I, I really struggle with a lot of Ecclesiastes, in particular this chapter, because is this a command just to be nihilistic? You know, just to say, you know, life is horrible. I'm just going to live in denial and be happy and drink a lot of wine and eat a lot of food. I mean, is that what it said, really? But I think as long as you find joy in your life. <laughs> I think what we do is we glom onto a single injustice and we we focus on that intently to say this is not fair and we miss all the beauty around us because we're we're just focused on why it's not fair that one thing is not fair in our lives and we miss all the rest. Yeah, good, good. All right, uh, let's let's press forward here. Uh, so verses four through ten, uh, a couple of headings here in red, uh, perhaps. Um, at least you're alive. <laughs> Everything else may be going bad, but at least you're alive. And um, and then all, all who live have opportunity, and permission to enjoy. And so here we come back to um, the nihilism: food, drink, self-care, relationships, and, and labor. So let me let me read this verse four. But he who is joined with all the living has hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. Go, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has already proved what you do. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or, or wisdom in Sheol, to which you are going. All right, so uh, uh, a, a living dog is better than a dead lion. A living dog is better than a dead lion. Um, you know, dogs, to us, dogs are like the center of our world. Uh, but that was not true in the ancient world. Uh, dogs were not necessarily pets. They were animals of disrespect and symbols of death and the underworld. So remember that next time you're with your dog. Uh, lions are regarded as noble and admired. In some way, they're still viewed that way today. Uh, nonetheless, the author says here, it's better to be a, a, a living dog, you know, to, to, to be at the lowest rung and still be alive is better than, than to be at the top, be at the lion, and to be dead. So at least you're alive. You may be a dog and, and all that comes with that, but at least you're uh, alive. And um, the author says, for, uh, uh, for he who is joined with all the living has hope. He who is joined with all the living has hope. What do you think he hope that comes just by being alive, even if you're a dog? Annie? Well, first of all, I'd like to offer a contemporary interpretation of um, uh, that they go for the living dog is better than a dead lion. It should say a uh, living dog is better than anything. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but I think what I'm struck by is how uh, very often something that's said literally also has a figurative similar connotation. But here I think that's a little bit mixed because he talks about um, those who are dead, the love and their hate. <clears throat> And in their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. I think literally that, of course, makes sense. But when you think about that from a figurative or a spiritual way, I, I almost think it's actually actually the opposite. You know, what we do in the world lingers on. Um, the memory of people, the joys they brought, the purpose they brought, the hate they brought, the destruction they brought. Those things can linger on. And I think going back to what you were saying about why be good or why be bad, 
is because it does last in the world. The goodness that I gained from this room today will go on, you know, wherever I go. Um, so I think it's it's interesting that juxtaposition very often is just in the literal sense of what these words say to us. But here I find it interesting that it goes even beyond that. Mm. Good, good, thank you. Yeah. Somebody else want to comment on what is the hope in, in merely living, in merely existing, rather than dead? I'm a, I'm a big believer in the potential for, for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And no matter how rocky life gets, we just have that second chance. Mm -hmm. We got tomorrow, and it could be really great. And we've all lived through a lot of tomorrows, and we know that that's true. Mm -hmm. It's the venture for itself. The, the preacher, you know, I love a lot of what he says, and I don't other parts. He, he probably wouldn't make it through an interview. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that you want to hire him. <laughs> but give him a book in the Bible, sure. <laughs> Pick it up, dog. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I love Ecclesiastes because it's an ancient document that if you sat around today, people would still be discussing. Yeah, I think, um, you know, as language here at the end of verse six, uh, talking about the dead, they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. And, and so the, the reverse is also true. As, as long as you're living, you have a share in all that's done under the sun. Um, and, and that's a good thing. I mean, even, even if you're a dog, you have a share in what's happening under the sun. There's, there's something bigger than you that's happening on this earth, in this life, under the sun, and you're a part of it. You may not understand that part. It may not be the part that you wanted, but you are a part of what's happening here under the sun. And, and that's a very good thing. Uh, because even, even in the worldview of the preacher, there is more happening under the sun than we realize. There is, there is a God who, who has some will, some desire that's somehow being worked out under the sun, and you're a part of it. So... That's awesome. At least, at least you're alive. Uh, I think what I hear you saying is you can't make a difference. You, you know, either that, mm. that yesterday wasn't that great. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, he urges us to uh, work with all our might um, because in, in his worldview, life under the sun is the only place where we can work. You know, I think um, once we get outside of the worldview of Ecclesiastes, we we might argue that that um, eternal life is actually a world of meaningful labor. Uh, we're not all going to be just, you know, lounging on clouds, <laughs> listening to harps. Um, there's meaningful work to be done uh, in eternity. But in his worldview, this life right here, it's, it's the one shot you've got to work. So wh whatever your work is, invest yourself in it. Do it with, with all your, your might. He mentions white garments and anointing oil. Um, let your garments be always white, that not oil be lacking on your head. Most likely, these are statements that make sense to people who are living in dry climates. And so hot, dry climates. So you wear white to be comfortable. And you want uh, plenty of oil on your head because the, your head gets uh, pretty dry as, as the rest of the skin is. So this is kind of like self-care. you know. As long as you're alive under the sun, go ahead and take good care of yourself. Put on some comfortable clothes. Take care of your skin. Eat some good food and enjoy life with your wife whom you love because uh, the rest of your life is vain, is, is full of hell, full of things that are unpredictable and that can be meaningless. So, yeah, take care of yourself and, and find some things to enjoy. Stop by Lake, Lake uh, 
George. Yeah, and and take it in because this is your one shot in, in life under the sun. Okay, I'm going to press on. We're going to stop at 1040 and uh, pray. So it, we've, we've got a, a written prayer request list. Do you have that? Okay. Um, and so if you didn't get uh, anything in that, you've got a prayer request, just let me know when we stop and pray. And for those of you who are online in the next five minutes or so, just take a minute to put a prayer request in the chat feature and uh, I'll pull that up so we can, we can see those as well. All right, so uh, verses 11 and 12. Again, I saw that under the sun, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to all. More unpredictability. Good and bad things happen to the worthy and the unworthy. The, the, the best athletes not always gonna win the race. The strongest armies not always gonna win uh, the battle. The wisest person isn't always going to get the bread or you know whatever the reward is there. Uh, the most the smartest person in the class isn't always going to get the scholarship. You know the, these things happen. There's there's unpredictability uh, that happens. Time and chance happen to us all. Uh, and then this uh, just wonderfully encouraging statement of verse twelve: For man does not know his time, like fish that are taken in an evil net. And like birds that are caught in a snare, so the children of man are snared in an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. We're all just fish waiting to be pulled up in the net. <laughs> very, very encouraging. Um, if this is true, if the race, the battle, the bread, or the favor doesn't always go to the one we think it should go to, you know, the one that it seems like deserves it, um, how, how should we approach then races, battles, life? I mean, what, what, what's he saying here? Is he saying just give up? Just because it doesn't always go to the one we think it should go to doesn't mean it mm -hmm. never happens. So continuing the fight and continuing the race, you still may win at some point, even yeah. if it's not today. So maybe these are exceptions to a rule that still exists, right? Every once in a while, the race isn't going to go to swift, but a lot of times it does. So, so keep running, right? Well, and, and you think about, particularly when it comes to race and justice in the United States, you know, I mean, the people in the 50s and 60s were fighting for that. Would they not be horrified that we're still dealing with this in 2022? I mean, but we built on what they did. It wasn't fruitless, mm -hmm. you know? That's right. Yeah. Even even when it looks like the race is not being won, there's there's progress being made. And it may be a longer race than we than we thought it was going to be. Yeah. Right. Is he perhaps calling us as Christians to encourage one another? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay. Sorry, just real quickly though. I think you also can look at the reverse and say, okay, the person who won the race wasn't necessarily the most deserving. The person that, because we often take that, well, you're successful and therefore you must be wise, or intelligent, or smart, and all that stuff. And sometimes it's just time and chance. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. you did your work, but time and chance happened to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and on our part, that could be a, a note of humility, right. you know. Um, okay, I won that race, but there were actually some faster people there. And so, they, you know, I'm, I don't have to get a big head about it. Right. Maybe the fastest person didn't show up. So yeah. you won the race. Yeah. Right. So maybe it's like a great equalizer. Mm -hmm. you know yeah. yeah. Good, good. What if we could raise without there being a sense that we need a just outcome. Mm -hmm. I mean, how freeing would that be? Mm -hmm. So kind of this indifference again, you know, what, what matters is, is the chance to be in the race and we, we just release all outcomes. Yeah. Okay, uh, good. We're going we're gonna to stop there and um, pray. I don't see any uh, comments in the chat feature from anybody. Um, in terms of prayer requests there.
So they'll, um, would you mind leaving us in prayer for anything that's been written down there? Gracious God, we come to you uh, grateful for the wisdom in the book like Ecclesiastes. It's just the observations of our common experience. It is the way life goes, and yet it has a sense of what our responsibilities and obligations are. Uh, and we're thankful for the gospel. It's added on top of Ecclesiastes and makes, uh, makes all the uh, difference. Uh, we have many people in our church family that we're uh, concerned about, that we pray for uh, regularly. Uh, but the ones that, uh, that have been brought up this morning, the people of Haiti, struggles they have, how hard life is, what a remarkable history that man has, and how many other countries in the world have added to their despair and made some of those countries see themselves as part of the solution. And for the people in the Ukraine, uh, continue to be with Zelensky, leaders of the Ukraine, leaders of Europe and the leaders of the West, that they will take uh, measured and effective responses, that uh, the world will uh, escape the, uh, the, uh, the kinds of leaders that, that lead the world to these kind of despicable moments, not just in Russia, but all around. <laughs> It's not that hard to recognize such people. Um, we ask you to continue to be with uh, Shearston uh, in her struggles, uh, be with uh, Julia's father, who's recovering from a broken hip, and who's uh, 88 years old. Uh, go with us now as we enter worship, as we enter into the threshold of the eternal, into the your presence with us in communion, in our singing and uh, prayers, and as your word is revealed to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Do you need a chair to back my father? Uh, yes.